I'm back. Let's see how long we can ride this wave. If you've seen as much anime as I have, probably become well acquainted to stories about teenagers and teenage issues overall. One thing that Japan has evidently been much less adamant about documenting in their fiction is all the stuff that comes afterwards, holding down a job, maintaining relationships, chasing your dreams, all that good stuff. As someone who's very sick of romances in particular without any real romance, I was already pretty predisposed to enjoy the 2006 shoujo manga adaption Nana, for not only leaving behind the safety net that is high school, but also starring adult characters in a strictly adult setting. Nana had my attention from the very beginning. Nana begins with a lively conversation on a train between two girls first finding out how much they have in common. They're both 20, they're both moving to Tokyo to chase their dreams, and curiously enough they're both named Nana. Due to a series of coincidences, they ultimately find themselves interested in the same apartment room and decide to move in together just for the purpose of shaving the rent in half. And with that, the setting for the series is established, with the audience not being given enough context to really care. The next four episodes are dedicated entirely to telling us who these people are and all of the events that brought them here. Nana Komatsu is a sweet, lively girl chasing after her boyfriend and desperately searching for independence from the family that is constantly supporting her. Despite being wholly pleasant and likeable, there are a number of key events that led to the person she ends up becoming. Nana's boy crazy phase during her teens led to her being known for falling in love at first sight with anyone handsome enough to grab her attention. This all blows up in her face when she ends up being abused and manipulated by a man during one of the most pivotal stages of her development. This makes Nana somewhat predisposed to unhealthy relationships with men, as well as utterly destroying her self-esteem. Her boyfriend Shoji honestly didn't know what he was getting into when he started going steady with her. When all of Nana's friends and lover find themselves moving to the city to better their careers, she follows them out of necessity, but only after saving to the point that she feels she can sustain herself. Nana's immature mindset and complete lack of personal responsibility leads to her absentmindedly taking advantage of people. Nana doesn't know how to live without coasting off the goodwill of others, which makes maintaining relationships that much more difficult. Shoji wants to support her, but also doesn't want to be the reason she's completely inept at supporting herself. Nana's problem is she thinks like a child, naturally assuming that someone will be able to swoop in and rescue her and putting the weight of her own problems onto everyone around her. She's a fun, bubbly girl, but on the inside she has some very real problems. And alongside her we have Nana Osaki. This Nana is very used to being alone, having been abandoned by her parents at a young enough age to not really have any memory of them, and raised by a grandmother who eventually died. Nana comes from a world where all of your success is earned, nobody gets anything for free, and bad things happen for no reason. Nana's light in the darkness is the bassist of Ren, who inspires her to join his band as a vocalist. Ren and Nana are depicted as soulmates, constantly bringing out the best in each other and being most comfortable when with each other. Nana's life is giving meaning through her music, and when finally given something to work towards, Nana dedicates herself wholeheartedly. It all comes crashing down when Ren ends up being recruited by one of the country's leading bands, and nobody has the heart to talk him out of it. He ends up leaving for Tokyo and becoming a star, leaving Nana and the other band members with no prospects. This incident, along with that of her parents, leaves Nana with massive abandonment issues that makes her incapable of opening up to or putting her faith in others. Nana dons her hardened punk rock exterior like a suit of armor, actively working to keep people out so as not to deal with the pain of them eventually leaving. Nana also decides to move to Tokyo, but with no intentions of chasing Ren down. Nana wants to make a name for herself and survive with her art by any means necessary. However, she specifically wants this to be something she achieves for herself, not through any association with Ren, who has already established himself as one of Japan's most popular up-and-coming musicians. She wants to be recognized for her talents, but more importantly, she wants this to be something she earns by her own hands. Nana at one point states that if there is one thing that people without a family want more than anything, it's a place they can call home. Nana isn't chasing fame, but rather stability. I'd say this show's greatest strength is its ability to take two damaged individuals and present them as something human and relatable. They're not defined by their failings and insecurities, but rather those aspects of them are simply allowed to exist. You know, like real people. Trauma does have a tendency to mess people up, but that doesn't mean they're not strong people capable of growth, and a few too many works of fiction do a terrible job communicating just how strong humans can be. Both Nanas immediately hit off, with Nana Osaki giving Nana Komatsu the nickname Hachiko due to her energy reminding her of a dog. So for the sake of convenience, I'll refer to her as that for, as well from now on. Anyway, Nana and Hachiko manage to bring the humour and empathy out of each other more effectively than any other character on the show. They achieve this by largely filling the holes in each other's personalities, with the headstrong Nana giving Hachi direction and a sense of self-worth, and Hachi helping Nana to open up with her warm and inviting personality. This series takes place in a world that is unforgiving and uncompromising. There is a consequence for every character's actions and nothing good will happen unless you make it happen. Hachiko's tragic flaw is that she doesn't understand what it means to be in a relationship, which will be fine, but she's also completely incapable of surviving without being in a relationship. For every instance she neglects her boyfriend in favor of some wacky escapade with her new friends, the more distance and negativity she builds up between them. At the end of the day, Shoji's gonna get lonely, and he ultimately finds it impossible to ignore how little he's getting out of the deal. Before long, everything blows up in Hachiko's face, and over the course of the series she learns that you need to give as much as you take in a real relationship, and the world will never revolve around her and her needs exclusively. 
Hachiko's best friend Junko is at once supportive and dedicated person she needs to be, while also being a perfect example of everything Hachiko is aspiring towards. She's conscientious, has a strong sense of responsibility, and is in a relationship not with a guy she idolizes as her protector, but rather her partner in life, with whom collaborating with makes a stronger, more capable whole. Nana also plays a massive role in Hachiko's development, while also never making any excuses for her. When Hachiko suddenly loses her job and is left wondering how she's going to survive for the rest of the month, Nana starkly reminds her that she still expects her to come up with half of the rent by the end of the month, and despite their friendship she has no issue kicking her out if she fails. Now whether she was bluffing or not is up for debate, but the fact is that Nana's unrelenting nature is what gave Hachiko the sense of urgency she needed to get back on her feet as soon as possible. In turn, Nana ends up being largely affected by Hachiko. It becomes apparent to both the characters and the viewer early on that Hachi does much more talking about herself than Nana does, who tends to silently observe with a joke here and there. Nana tries to keep the details of her life shrouded in mystery, while Hachi naturally pulls those things out of her. When the old band do manage to meet up in Tokyo and make decent progress towards their dreams, Hachiko remains one of their biggest groupies, with the success of Blast being one of the first things that she really becomes passionate about, even finding them a hip young bassist to take Ren's place. Nana eventually becoming reunited with Ren ends up leaving her conflicted. For as safe as she feels in his arms, she also isn't comfortable being in such an ill-defined relationship with someone that is supposed to be one of her biggest musical rivals. Nana is probably the most dedicated, passionate, and driven character on the show, never losing sight of her ambitions and working diligently towards her goals. She describes her lofty mission statement as to polish the shards of her dreams. That's pretty much the largest struggle of mankind as a whole when you think about it taking the overwhelming evil and trauma dormant within a soul and channeling it into something constructive, like a debut album or an anime analysis video. There's a reason Nana's music speaks to people on a base emotional level, especially to younger women. It communicates something profound and meaningful about Nana and her experiences in a level of depth that language isn't capable of. With that said, let me take this opportunity to compliment the show's ability to accurately depict live performances with the perfect level of energy and life. There is a somewhat ethereal quality to these scenes thanks to the fantastic shot composition and the listless nature of Nana's vocal performance, and you really feel the effect they're having on the audience. The show doesn't have particularly high animation quality, but I was often impressed by how tight some of the show's illustrations can be, and how well they sold the show's fun, silly sense of humour. One of my favourite scenes early on was when Nana joins Hachi to visit her family. Hachiko complains endlessly about how embarrassing they are, while Nana simply muses on how pleasant it feels to be surrounded by the type of warmth and togetherness that family brings, bringing Hachiko closer to her than ever before. This ability to take characters with circumstances so far removed from your own and make them relatable and empathetic is one of Nana's greatest strengths. I found myself blown away by how much I cared about these characters and how much I wanted to see them succeed, which only makes it that much more painful when they suffer. Make no mistake, this show can be brutal. Just like real life can be brutal, sometimes bad things happen to good people, and even more heartbreaking, sometimes good people do bad things. Watching characters you love succumb to their weaknesses or cave under the pressure of their situation is not only brutal on the characters, but on the audience. I am not exaggerating when I say that there are scenes in this show that are among the most painful and emotionally taxing that I've ever seen in fiction, and I often have to break up the tension with a dumb cartoon just to allow my heart rate to lower. That's the kind of show this is. I don't really want to get into a whole mess of spoilers, but let me just say this guy right here is one of my most hated characters in anime, and I'll just leave it at that. At one point in the series, Hachiko tells Nana that we were born as women, so let's be happy as women. It was this line that clued me into what this series was really about. Characters being dealt certain cards and us watching how they react to them. Bills, politics, paparazzi, it all hits the characters like a ton of bricks and the tension is built around how they plan on dealing with it. Nana is near unprecedented in anime for how true to life it presents its conflicts and characters. This show could have me drowning in tears on the edge of my seat, laughing my ass off or soul crushingly depressed without ever feeling forced or cliche. Everything feels grounded, intimate, relatable and real. Everything I was asking for going in, but wasn't quite ready for. This series represents the moments of levity in life flawlessly and manages to strike a perfect balance between stress and fun. The budding romance between Blast's bassist Shin and Trapness's vocalist Layla was also thoroughly compelling. These two characters are so desperate for any sort of connection that they seek comfort in the most unexpected ways and are just as surprised as the viewer when their scandalous affair evolves into true feelings of affection. I also loved how sexual this show could be in nature while also never being trashy or self-indulgent like a lot of other shows I've seen, which I feel is the direct effect of the characters being realistically portrayed as adult women, as opposed to the idealised sweethearts that a lot of otaku-centric shows like to push. Again, it works so flawlessly because every aspect of the series and its characterization feels so organic and real. Nana is one of my favourite anime series and I can't really recommend it enough, especially for women around the age of the characters. I watched this show's 47 episodes in the course of a week, and as someone who sometimes struggles finishing 26 episode series over the course of several months, take my word for it that when you start this series you won't be able to stop. That's not to say I consider this show perfect or anything, I could probably give some grievances about the resolution and a few other nitpicks, but nothing that could really dampen my love for the show and everything it accomplished. With that said, everyone watching this, take to the comments and tell me what show to talk about next, and that's the way the news goes.